Um, and I'm here with After the Rolls, and I'm so excited. I get to interview Erica Chappelle um, about um, her game Flying Circus, which I get to play too. So that makes me really happy. Um, and I always forget that I'm supposed to announce things at the beginning of this. And so as soon as we go on, I'm like, uh, what am I? Huh? So let me try to remember. Um, so we have two sponsors. Uh, we have So Nerdware. Uh, you can go to SoNerdware.com and get really, really cool t-shirts. Um, they have like every kind of pride, everything, like every flag. And then they have like combinations of the two flags as like a D20. It's like every, it's cool. So, um, so Nerdware. And we're also sponsored by DM Emporium. Um, DM Emporium is like a one-stop shop um, for D&D related stuff. So they've got, you know, your typical dice and stuff, but they also have drinking horns and a tunic, which that's cool. Um, and both of those, if you go, you can enter a code, which someone's going to enter into Discord because one of them is friends and one of them is forward. And I can't remember which one. Um, and you'll get 10% off and some of that money will go to support the channel. Uh, so that's one announcement. The other is I think we actually have an emote for those of you who are subscribers, finally, we got one. It's really adorable. Um, so somebody's gonna put that up in the chat and you can see it and use it if you're a subscriber. Um, and uh, I don't think I have any more announcements because it's not Pride Month anymore. So there's not a hundred things happening. Um, so Erica, why don't you take a second and introduce yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Erica Chapel. I wrote Flying Circus. I have a publishing name that I use called New Stands Press, under which there's a bunch of other games. And uh, that's my entire introduction. <laughs> right. That's right. Thanks to your introduction, I know that I mispronounced your last name. So now I know. It's and I actually, you can't. Correctly. You, you can't, can't mispronounce my, own, my last name. I'm an English speaker from Montreal. So I've heard it both ways. And I, at this point, I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah, both are right. So I just introduced a little bit of, of, of extra flair into yeah. your last name for the, yeah, no, I like that, that works. Um, so I have a, a number of things that I, I wanna talk to you about, about your game. Um, and I guess the first thing, and I think you mentioned this early on too in the handbook, um, is your influences. Um, and it, I, I wrote these down because I love them and they're so disparate and bringing them together in, in the way that you do, I really enjoy. Um, it's Miyazaki films, fairy tales and World War II. Um, one, the first one. I meant one, yes. I was looking at a one, and I said too, <laughs> you know, that's my day. Um, so talk to me about where those influences came from. Why, why those specific things? So this game went through a bit of a design journey as most games do. Originally, it was going to be much more like Apocalypse World. It was going to be a much grittier game that was mostly rooted in the, like the World War I imagery. Uh, it was gonna be black and white art. It was going to be this much darker game. Um, mostly because I typically write those, like most of my games are pretty bleak. Um, and so that's kind of how it started with this like idea of doing that. And then the idea of the Ghibli movie influence of it crept in slowly as I started working on some of the character expression ideas. And like, as the second portion of the game started cementing of like, this is about more than pilots and more than a post-apocalypse. This is like, probably about the pilots and the found families they make because you know right. characters important part right like initially this game started as a brainwave where i was like oh my god what if i made a game where you had an airspeed indicator and an altitude indicator on your sheet and you use them as resources and use them like tracks like in in like the clocks in apocalypse world that was the whole and like i could use moves to make it so that you can do air stuff without having to know how airplane go and like, oh, that's the yes. whole game. I'm so thankful for that because I can play the game and not, I do not know how I play, no, I don't. Yeah, know how <laughs> so there, there is a part of the new version that's coming out of like, here's a little bit how airplane works. So you can like read this part and use these words, but um, <laughs> like. And then I can feel good that I use those words. Exactly. And like, I'm fooling you. <laughs> I sound like I know how airplanes work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but like, like initially it was just going to be this, this, this really dark thing and then uh, and that's, I even kickstarted it with the idea that there was going to be like some, like the Studio Ghibli inspiration was already starting to creep in because I wanted to do more magic stuff. And I got this idea of like, okay, the reason they fly everywhere is because the forests are deep and scary in Princess Mononoke. Um, and then as I developed it more, and as I started working on the art, 
I started, first off, I started hating doing the art in just black and white. And I started experimenting with color and it looks so much better. And then I started like making the lines thinner and bringing more like anime influences into it because I'm a weeb. Um, and I started liking it more and more and the planes started resembling the planes in Miyazaki movies. And I started going, oh, maybe this is the angle that I should go. And I started like pushing more Ghibli influence into some of the ideas. I started rewatching all the Ghibli movies that I, I loved when I was like a teenager. And a lot of like, basically I watched Nausicaa Valley of the Wind for the first time I'm since I was like 11. One. Yeah. And it clicked like, oh, yeah. this isn't just a post-apocalypse. This has to be a Ghibli apocalypse. This has to be one of those mm -hmm. things where the apocalypse took the poison out of the world and what's left is something that can rebuild, yeah. right? Because like, that's the big difference between the two first Ghibli movies, uh, Castle in the Sky and Nausicaa and traditional post-apocalypse stories is that a traditional post-apocalypse story is about everything that we have lost, mm -hmm. right? And it's about like this, um, you know, the struggle for what's remaining. Whereas the Ghibli apocalypse movies are usually set like, I mean, a big difference between Flying Circus and those movies is that those movies are set thousands or hundreds of years after an apocalypse. And this one is set like a generation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But the still the more important part is like, what have we built? What can we keep? What lessons did we learn? Right. And also what are we repeating is another aspect that's really important. Uh, and as that started working in, it started informing a lot more of it. And then the, like the fairy tale stuff, actually kind of got chased out a little bit as I realized that the Ghibli angle is more interesting, but mm -hmm. you can still see its roots in the way that the Fae are terrifying. <laughs> yeah. The fairy tale part is hiding in the woods. Yeah, exactly. And like <laughs> the fact that it's a little bit out of the way until it isn't, and that's a really big problem is works really well. It's really easy to forget that this is a game that has an incredibly hostile world. Well, and I, you know, you, I was so excited when you mentioned Nausicaa because for the longest time that was my favorite anime. I, mean, I haven't seen it since like the mid '90s, so it's very good. You should watch it again. I really should. I really, oh, I really should. Um, I definitely have to. And I just remember, I remember a moment in the handbook where you talk about how the the people left behind, um, the little settlements that are left behind after this just horrible uh, war full of death and and murder and all of that are actually like pretty decent people for the most part. Yeah. Like they're they're fundamentally pretty okay. And uh, and I it reminded me of the villagers if I recall correctly in Nausicaa very much. Yeah, it's it's that same sort of thing. Like the 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 idea like another of the ideas of this game that is like rooted in there is people are fundamentally pretty okay. Systems are bad, you know, like systems can be problems. Um but like the the whole idea is that there's now a fresh start and hopefully the people who are left can use that as an opportunity um, to, to build a, a kinder and more just world. Um, I mean, there is fraught stuff with that. And that's kind of where like, you know, I started developing that stuff simultaneously to like, oh yeah, I should make them little like cartoon Germans. Cause I love the little, like the, 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 the main impetus was people will associate pointy helmets with world war one. So if I put those in, they'll know what time period this is supposed to be. <laughs> that makes sense. And then I'm yes. like a year into the development of it and went, oh my God, I'm building an early 20th century pastoral fantasy Germany. Oh my God, there's so much that can go wrong with this. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely. And yeah. I think you you talk in the, in the handbook about really kind of wanting to dispel some of the myths about early... 20th century Germany and especially the myth of homogeneity yeah. um, and really kind of pull in the idea that even these cultures that have presented themselves as being un unilateral really aren't. Yeah, that was like a huge, once I realized that was happening, that became like a huge development priority. Uh, especially I had this conversation with um, uh, my, my German consultant, uh, Fina, who um, I told her like, you know, this is what I'm doing. I was talking about the Fishers specifically and like mm -hmm. their relationship to everybody else with this idea that the Fishers are not supposed to be a foreign culture to everybody else. Um, and I made a comparison between two different German states and she was like, oh, you have no idea how Germany works. You have no idea how Europe works. If you think that 
it's the same thing as like people from BC or Ontario, right? Like those were countries before they were Germany. Mm -hmm. There are national identities within national identities. And that started the wheels turning on this like, this thinking of ways to present the lack of homogeneity and like even within groups that see themselves as kin, there are divisions. Um, and that's kind of, that's where the people card mechanic came from, which to this day is my favorite part of the entire game because there's nothing like sitting down at a convention to run this game and having them like pick out their playbooks and like they're looking it over. And then I hand out the people cards and I say like, pick one or more. Can you explain and, what the people cards are? So right, yeah, so it. they're basically, they're index cards, they're eight index cards, and they have ethnicities on them. <laughs> they have like fictional yet familiar ethnicities. And you can get a sense by reading them kind of how they relate to one another. Um, and it immediately recontextualizes the character you're making when they re you realize that they fit into a world with a history. Because a lot of characters in role-playing games tend to be unanchored. Like it's a huge part of like Dungeons and Dragons is your characters, they have a hometown, but it doesn't matter. They, you know, like, who are they? Well, they're, you know, like maybe you have an idea that they're from a kingdom, but what does that kingdom mean? Like, it's just arbitrary political, you know, yeah. lines on a map, right? They like, could exist in almost any fantasy environment. and Exactly. Beyond. Yeah. Right. They're just like, they're the sword, the sword boy. Um, the sword boy. <laughs> I wanted perfect. to put a lot of work into making sure that characters had a sense of history and a reason for leaving home. Right. And like a, a, a top, like a set of ties to deeper and more lasting issues in the world. So even if you just play a one shot, you know your character's from somewhere. And you can also, there is nothing better than watching the people looking at those cards and then looking what other people are taking. <laughs> <laughs> and it really, it really does an incredible job of like giving context. And context is like hugely important to a game like this. Uh, because it means that the characters are people instead of these interchangeable, instead of character classes. And the fact that it actually synchronizes with the backgrounds being places where people are from instead of just like expressions of, um, you know, mechanical yeah. speciality means that, um, well, first off, because the people cards and the backgrounds are don't necessarily mesh one to one. You can see the way that you know there is diversity even within these groups. Uh, you can see how like the world is bigger than just your character, and you can start to see how like the world goes together around you. Because when you build towns in this game, the same way you build characters, you pick a background set from one of the ten, and you pick a people card or more than one. And the most interesting towns have more than one. You know, and then you put that stuff together and you get like interesting places that can have histories and politics that affect one another. And that's why the map making get part of this game is so much fun. And, you know, like it's it's a set of emergent depth that comes from ultimately 18 pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, as you were saying that, I realized that it, with the playbooks that I hadn't clicked at before is that really they do start with where are you from and then move to what can you do? But that's they secondary. Start, they start with, where are you from? And then they go to, wh why did you leave? And that's another really important one. Because this is a conversation I had with somebody on Twitter who, can't remember who. I'm bad at, I'm really bad at memory. Um, but this conversation about how one of the problems with fantasy worlds is that they always are presenting cultures and they're never showing cultures changing. Mm -hmm. They're always... Uh, or diversity you know, the within the culture, right? Uh, more than that, it's yeah. a sort of concession to essentialism that is really unfortunate because like, you know, part of national identity often comes down to this idea that not only is national identity real, not only is this thing matter, but it's something that has existed forever. And it's something that is like, will continue to last forever. And unfortunately, like one, like a lot of this game is secretly about where fascism comes from, uh, which, I wonder why it's that. I'm um, going to ask you another question about that in a minute. Yes. Yeah, but like a part of that is this, the, the that national mythology is very, can lead very quickly to an idea of national destiny. Mm -hmm. um, 
And a huge part of this was to give the impression that like, oh no, there are pressures within cultures that change them and they're yeah. present. And that's the reason that your character is a pilot and not a villager. Your farmer is not currently plucking, you know, like moving hay around with his hands mm -hmm. and is instead almost dying in a kite because something about his home isn't right. Um, I actually, in the new version that's coming out, I added a new question to almost all the playbooks, a new development question, which is just what would have to change back home before you return? Ooh, ooh I love that. And oh, that's I, fantastic. Like, I think that that does a really good job of illustrating yeah. what those, like the, the idea behind like, oh no, all this stuff is in flux. And even the, like, the way the game's set up is like, the flying circus thing isn't gonna last forever. These are the second generation of them. And there's maybe one more after this. And the thing I really want to do at some point is write like an expansion where it's 15 years on and you have the people who can't retire and the kids who are like just on the edge of it, like, you know, who want to capture the last bits of glory as the as society becomes safe again. And there's not room for 20 somethings in airplanes drinking and fighting. Yeah, that makes sense. Actually, really quick, <clears throat> excuse me, why don't you define what you mean by flying circus for everybody? Right, yeah. yeah. So the, the flying circuses in this game that the game is named for are mercenary companies. Um, and they're named after a real life historical thing. The Red Baron had his bright red plane and we all know about it. But what a lot of people don't realize is that every German pilot by like 1917 had a crazy pattern on his plane. The Red Barons is just the most famous. Um, but ev all the German pilots were customizing their planes and the people who did it the most were the Red Baron squadron, uh, which was known as the flying circus by British airmen because rather than picking a part of the line and staying there, they'd be shuttled up and down the line to wherever they were needed. They were like the 40 best pilots in the German army. They would pluck the aces out of whatever squadrons that they were doing well in and they'd stick them together in, in you know, hunting wing one. Um, and they'd go and Wherever they went, it was bad news. Uh, and that's and they were called the Flying Circus because they you know, traveled the line and they would come up in this beautiful array of colors. And the idea that the arrival of your squadron to a place has an effect on the town in the way that a circus might come in, complete with sense. like an image I never got into the book and I really wanted to was a circus's airship coming in and it looks like a circus tent. I was I just never gonna say like they fly there. in looking like the colors of a circus tent. Yeah, I never I never sense. got that art in and I'm oh. so bitter and I'll put it in an expansion. No, I mean, no wonder, I mean, there were other reasons to, but no wonder you had to move to having color in the book. And yeah. when you, I was thinking about the, the planes when you were saying that, that you had originally started in black and white because it's so clear in the section about making your plane, how being colorful and having design and having like a, a sense of like expressing yourself through this plane is important to, yeah. to who you are, yeah. And another part of that is this idea that like, uh, I didn't want this game, like this game is about airplanes, but I didn't want it to be about war machines, except as bad guys, which is why it's really important to me that the airplanes become primarily canvases of self-expression. Even if what you do with them is go and fight stuff in the air. The idea of them being like ways of identifying your character in shorthand is really important. And then that also allows you to do something really cool, which is, um, if you set up a rival circus or a rival pilot, you can tell the players what their plane looks like when they land somewhere. And then later, when they get into a fight with them, they know the rondelles. They know what the big fancy planes that the ace fly looks like. They know what the color schemes are. They can, and they can, even if they don't, they've never seen that pilot's face, they know stuff about them. And that's like really important. Sorry, my dog is having a good time outside cool. of my door. Um, what I love is that we get her barks, but then we also get my wife going, shh, <laughs> she barks. <laughs> um, I was thinking you were talking about how this is sort of a, a growth period for the cultures that you're talking about and a change period. It's 20 years after yeah. everything sort of blew up and reset. Um, and that having these these mercenary companies is sort of a a, a, a feature of that phase that like in another 15 years it might not be quite yeah. it might not fit as well and I you talk about like how so many role-playing games are I'm gonna try to use this word and say it right and probably won't build this buildings Roman coming of uh, age stories do not ask right? me to pronounce things no? okay I, I don't won't. know I have coming been struggling with Duolingo to learn German for two years now and I don't know anything <laughs> Well, so uh, we'll uh, just say coming of age stories and why yeah, exactly. that's something that we really focus on in these kinds of stories. 
Um, so, like, they're kind of a lot of uh, role playing games are kind of accidentally those because what we want in role playing games is for our characters to to grow as people and become stronger. Though usually that just means getting more points in dexterity so that you can use the bigger bows and get the feet you want because you laid out their entire growth path before you started the character because D&D 3.5 is like poison to <laughs> role-playing games. <laughs> but, um... <laughs> I don't uh, have any you opinions know. on that. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Um, but like the idea of this game as a coming of age thing was like, I mean, I love coming of age stories so much. Um, probably partially because I like wasn't a person when I was a teenager. I was just a sad lump of dysphoria and depression. So like I, I look back on coming of age stories and just like, oh my God, put it in my veins. I need to live vicariously through them. Uh, so the idea of this game is like being about young people is really important on top of its connection to World War One, where these pilots were like 18, 19. Some of them were as young as like 16 and 15, which is like horrifying. Um, and so the idea of this game being about growing up was really important. And that's why when the worker stretch goal got, went and I had like, I was like, I threw that in there because I had a few ideas for mechanics and I was like, I'll never hit that. No, oh my God. Um, so the worker quickly became the character who's already grown up mm -hmm. as like this, this like counterbalance to everybody else. And that was like really, that was neat. Um, but yeah, like the, the game being about young people building a community was really important and it's also where like the move exchange system came from the idea of like placing an in-universe reason for people to pick up moves from other playbooks which has always been present in apocalypse world and framing it as cultural exchange yeah. was like a like good get for the game and i'm glad i thought of it because like it does a really good job of showing how these characters are growing in their interactions with one another um, and, and like also helping with the, you know, the fact that these characters are probably going to retire and that's probably going to like your campaign is going to end in destinies or retirement is like, it helps with that, that feeling of transition and that feeling of like, you know, temporariness, which is something that I first noticed in a game called Red Markets. Called what? Red Markets. Red Markets. It's a game about, uh, zombies, but it's actually a game about capitalism. It has this really interesting idea where the main characters are, they're called takers. And what they do is they grab IDs of zombies and they sell them to the government so the government can use them to make censuses hmm. okay. um, to tell who's alive and who's dead. Um, the takers have all sold their own IDs and declared themselves dead already for the extra money because they're stuck outside the safe zones. But there's this huge thing about how like, it's five years in and we're running out of zombies. This market is going to crash. And like, that's a huge part of this. Everybody is getting in now while there's still a chance to get rich quick. Um, and that was like an idea there of like, so these aren't the first generation of these guys. And the first generation of these guys weren't in it for business. The first generation of flying circuses were like, oh my God, there's like a billion bugs streaming out of the forest and they're going to eat our town. Somebody get in the old planes and do something. And these guys are like the ones who have, figured out that that's a business um yeah. and but at the same time they're not in it for the money you can retire by selling your plane immediately at game start like it's not you about have a lot that. more money yeah that's one of the things I and you, you and, and I I read this part later and I was like oh that's so true like trying to make finances work like you're not getting rich no <laughs> the, the, this game is like in the money goes through your hands like water in this yes. game because it's not about the money you got, it like, feels a lot like my lot. life the players aren't I mean, you can get rich doing this. Like there is definitely at one point um, in one of the, the, the play tests for this, like they stole a Zeppelin and they got like 90 Thaler out of it. And that was a moment where they could have gone like, yeah, we're done. Mm -hmm. Char characters just going to retire somewhere. Um, build, build a money castle. Um, but um, like, that's not what it's about. It's about finding stuff. And so I like then use that moment to, have the character articulate reasons why they are still flying, even though they are now filthy rich. Yeah. And Makes then sense. within a couple of weeks, they are back to being broke. Yeah. That's what I've experienced for yeah. sure. Um, I, and I, I want to go back to something that you mentioned because it resonated so strongly with me. Um, and uh, I've talked before, the last time that, um, I was talking to, to um, the creator of um, Glitter Hearts, and we were talking about found families, but you mentioned something else too, which was how 
you know, as folks who, when we grew up, maybe we weren't able to be who we really were um, for various reasons, right? And most of us who fall within this sort of broad LGBTQIA sort of experience have that. Uh, our craving coming of age because there was a way in which we missed our coming of age. Yeah. Right? And there's other reasons too. Like I, you know, both of my parents were really sick when I was a teenager, so I didn't get to do that. Um, and I crave those stories and I'm always torn between being the old wise one because I'm old um, and the coming of age. But like, it makes sense why we keep getting drawn back to those stories in a different kind of way. Yeah. And sort of uh, connecting to the queer thing more directly, a element of this game, like part of the meta of this game is like, you can read this game as the pilots, as, anal you know, allegorical queer people moving to the city and finding other people like them. Like that was like an element that emerged kind of organically as I was doing it. And I went like, all right, I'll lean in. <laughs> you know? Definitely. Definitely. And you had said the culture of pilots is essentially queer. Yeah. Like yeah. even, you know, even your straight pilots are not welcome anywhere anymore as like a part of the fabric of places because they're traveling. The pilots have a reputation. Uh, they don't like, they don't get to be a part of the, 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 the heterosexual structure of like settling down, having a fa family, being a part of a place. So like that was like an element that, that came out of it and also informs a lot of the stuff in the playbook about how like, I think one of my favorite lines in the book is about how, you know, pilots are folk heroes, uh, which means that everybody follows your stories and kids look up to you and probably want to kill you when they get older. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like they want to be the ones to shoot you down because most of the time they, they know you as the people who roll into town and just fuck shit up. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. And that experience of being an outsider, I think, is really woven through a lot of um, a lot of the playbooks. And I mean, I'm particularly because I play a Fisher. So I really. Yes, those, I love them. And you tell oh. they're my favorite class. <laughs> I love them so much. And I actually saw you make a reference to the Cthulhu mythos and how you were sort of taking and, and reclaiming part of that with the Fisher folk. Yeah, so, I mean, like, the Fishers did not start as cute shark people. I am so glad they became cute shark people. <laughs> they did not start that way. They started as a, an ode to a role-playing game I really like called Alas for the Awful Sea. Love that game. Okay. It's really good. Yeah. And so they emerged from this idea of like, okay, I was trying to build a world that felt plausibly early, like turn of the century. And among the things that was there was like, oh man, wouldn't it be great to have this dynamic of like the people who sit on the, the cliffs and look wistfully out hoping for their loved ones to return from the awful sea. Um, and that developed further into like, we're, we're batting around ideas for mythology and like the idea of like, oh, we should have some, something in the water like as part of the originally this thing had like a trinity of weird like sacred creatures that i ditched because i don't like that kind of mythology and it was mm -hmm. like something i was developing with a friend and we were just batting ideas around but you can still see remnants of it in like how the 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 uh whales are kind of the sky whales are kind of sacred and stuff like that but like the i, I basically as i was writing it the circumstances of the, the cliff people, of the fishers, became more and more drastic and exaggerated because I'm, like, I'm a person who likes extremes. I like pushing concepts to its most extreme form. Um, and so like the sea became like, they have to stay in balloons because the sea will eat them. And then that became like, you know, like the, the, the cliffs themselves are dangerous. And then that became like, oh, they're living beside like horrible, awful monsters that will eat them. And then I started thinking about it more like the, you know, like the, the, the religious aspects of it, like maybe they're like worshiping and trying to appease the things under the sea. Mm -hmm. And then I like stopped for a second and went like, maybe I'm doing this wrong. Maybe they shouldn't be afraid. And the idea of like the stuff under the sea, like the reason that the sea takes them is because it like literally draws them into an embrace and won't an, an embrace and not let them go was so cool. Yes. And the idea of reframing, like the Cthulhu stuff was starting to creep in. And once I was consciously aware of it, I went, Ugh. and then I went, well, it's a like, even though it's horrible and you know, like 
HP Lovecraft was the worst. Um, everybody recognizes it as a nerd touchstone, which means I can do stuff with it. And the idea of taking the Cthulhu mythos and going, oh no, like it's just, they're just a religion. And then that started developing into the idea of like, what if I started making them freaky? What if I started down this like Innsmouth thing? And that happened like, so I mentioned earlier off the stream that I did quests to test this game. And the quest I did is called Whispers from the Deep. Whispers um, from the Deep. And it's about a fisher. It's about a fisher named Isabel Morgenthau, which is the best name on the fisher sheet. Um, and everybody takes, I've read like four different games where people make characters named Isabel Morgenthau. And I go like, no, that's my character. How dare. Uh, but I, all the fisher weirdness developed because I kept wanting to make her weirder. Um, and so like, the, the fact that she has gills was revealed like 12 updates in as like a footnote, basically. Um, and then like the fact that she has like gray skin and like that she bleeds blue came up because she started bleeding. And like, you know, all those, 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 um, those aspects of the character developed out of this idea, this, this need to make her weird um, and like make her different so that the move that the fishers have, the creepy move, which was totally undeveloped when I started the, the quest. Like none of, the, there was no background when I started the quest. I was like, I'm going to make a world to run this and then I'm going to use that world in the game. Um, and like all that stuff developed at it. And I'm so glad it did because it gives them this like bizarre, like they're weird. And then you find out that like, oh no, they're just like a part of the dominant identity. People are mostly okay with them and only get freaked out by them when they reveal themselves to not be very much like everybody else after all. Yeah. Um, which also, as the identity stuff came together in this game, it became like a weird little metaphor for conditional whiteness. I don't know. Like, like it, 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 the way that it all sort of fit together to give all the cultures more depth was really neat. And I was really glad about that. Well, and I just, that, that moment where you said like, what if, what if I'm not afraid? What if, what if these things that we treat as horrifying or horrible or monstrous, we don't need to be afraid of? Yeah, exactly. And that like, that immediately takes the teeth out of all the H.P. Lovecraft stuff. H.P. Lovecraft was a person who had like a bazillion phobias. You know, this, this guy based an entire franchise on the fact that seafood scared the shit out of him. Um, and I get it. Like, I won't eat shrimp. Shrimp are bugs. They're creepy. They, uh. But like, the idea of just subverting that and being like, Oh yeah, no, they, you know, the, 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 the fishers are these degenerates that have mixed their blood with, you know, horrible sea creatures from, you know, under the dark waves of this horrible sea that's punched itself through the middle of the continent. And they are just normal folk. Yeah. <laughs> They're just people. They're just, yeah. just I actually cute even fish people. I <laughs> actually even adorable. get that spirit them. when I play a fisher of like, everyone else is afraid of this thing that he's not afraid of. And, and it, it affects who he is to yeah. just be like, no, just don't be afraid. And there's so much fun to draw. Oh my God. I have oh, so much. That. Yeah, no. Oh. Okay. I, that big bar fight scene. I a hundred percent drew the Fisher in it first. And then it was like, and I will draw a bar fight around her. <laughs> nice. Another thing that you talk about in those playbooks um, that, I, that I thought was really relevant too, to the way you're talking about culture was, was gender and gender identity. And the way that it's worded so differently, depending on the playbook that you choose. Yeah. So this is one of the things that I do that is perhaps not the prescribed method in like role playing game stuff is that I make the worlds kind of suck a little. Because um, like, you know, I understand the appeal behind aspirational fiction. I understand why people want stories that like give people a break from the bullshit. Um, but it's not how I identify with stories. Um, and it's not how I identify with characters. Like one of the most important things to me when writing uh, or reading characters is this idea of like shared hardship. Like yeah. that's what's relatable to me. Um, which is why like a whole bunch of elements of this game set themselves up to be like, Here's all the ways your characters can hurt that you might relate to. And let's make this a game about healing, yeah. which I think is, I like, I'm not knocking people who make games that are, and like stories and fictional worlds that are 
more egalitarian, more nice, better. Like those, we need those kind of stories too. But I think that it's important that we also have stories where we can identify the kind, like we can identify with the hurt within it and use that as a way of reflecting on ourselves and use that for catharsis and use that for things like that. And like a huge part of Flying Circus is that. And that's kind of the reason why the gender stuff in that game, you know, as somebody who did a gender. Um, who did a gender. Yeah, a gender <laughs> well, happened but, to me. I fell yeah. in the gender vats. Um, but like, like a huge part of the reason why the gender stuff in this game is so like, like every single playbook deals with it differently and none of them deal with it perfectly mm -hmm. um, is, and like on top of the fact it's built into this expectation system that you are invited immediately to say like, actually, no, fuck that. That's not who my character is, um, is, is very deliberate because I really wanted this game to be about like places that aren't ideal. And that's why you left. And that's why like a lot of the, like, the farmer's playbook is like, what's the gender options that are listed on it? It's like masculine, feminine. And then it tells you if you don't like it, you know, tell us why. Um, or like the really important one to me is the witch. Um, mm -hmm. When I was a teenager, I had a terrible relationship with radical feminism. In probably the opposite way that you would expect a apparently teenage boy to, in that I was really into it. And all of the really awful things that come out of like, Dianic Wicca, mm -hmm. like gender essentialist nonsense. I was a turf. Um, and that's why, like, that playbook exists is this, like, there is power to this gender essentialist view of women that comes from the empowerment uh, and, like, focusing on you know, the, the thing in the, the playbook about how, you know, the traditional Christian view of women is secondary, uh, unclean, you know, like, uh, subservient. And then to, to, you know, there's a reason that people gravitate towards version, like views that are like empowered and special, yeah. uh, but it's ultimately still gender essentialist nonsense, right? Like it, it's, yeah. it is a patch fix to a deeper problem. And the witch is built around the kind of people who gravitate towards those patch fixes and the kind of people who try to seize a, that kind of power. And it's not wrong. Like it's not wrong to want that. It just happens within a context. And the fact that there, this is a game where anybody can play any character, but you have to grapple with the fact that the the play sheet says, you know, according to what everybody knows about witches, there are only female witches. Like every every other one, it's you know, it's presentation based. It's masculine, feminine. Mm -hmm. This one, woman, deal. And the uh, uh, unfortunately, it used to be a blank space because this used to work differently. And our really good line but I don't know if I made it into the final thing about how the most interesting witches, witches come from claiming the blank space with their pen. Um, Ooh, that is a yeah. good line. Yeah, yes. like that, that was important to me uh, to have that in there. And like, it's kind of funny that all the fiction that has been written about this, there's fiction written about Flying Circus. Um, every one of them has had a trans witch. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. I love it. Uh, can you like, let's, let's, I want to hear that line again. And can you just give us a little bit more about what that line means to you? So like the idea, the, the, the line is, was something about like, you know, there, there only women is, is written here, but there is also like a blank spot. The most, uh, uh, oh, I think it's, you know, um, something about interesting or powerful, which mm -hmm. has come from claiming that place with a your pen. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, I think because like that's another thing is that um, the way the the expectation system came together is that I I had um I got involved in a Twitter discourse uh, <laughs> where people were talking about like how fiction shouldn't have real world problems in them. Do not put hi hierarchies of oppression in your fiction, uh, which I understand the sentiment. I don't. That's not how I want to write fiction. Like I, I get I get it. Um, but I wrote a thread about that and in which I said, the problem is when people associate the, the problem is when the hierarchy of, of oppression isn't in the fiction. The problem is when the hierarchy of oppression manifests itself in the way that the fiction is told. Mm. Stories are about people who break the rules. Write stories about people breaking the rules. If you have a story where, you know, in this culture, women can't X, the most interesting story you can tell of, of, in that setting is a woman doing X, right? Like, and that's the story ever, like nobody wants to read the story that's about 
the way that the society is supposed to be. And when people tell those stories, they're kind of telling on themselves a little bit about how they think that um, the way a society is, uh, like the way that a society governs itself and the way a society mm -hmm. actually is, is the same thing where it's not true. Everybody's always broken the rules all the time. Yeah. Um, and does on the stories we remember are very often the stories of people who break the rules. And so that was what I wanted to get across with that. This idea of like, yes, there is a restriction here. Flaunt it and you will have an incredible character. That makes sense. Well, and I, I think, and I, I tend to to feel you on, on having there be elements of hierarchy and oppression in some of our stories in part because I think when we think about found families, um, especially amongst LGBTQIA people, like that is some of the glue that holds us together is that we're people who, who had no choice but to break the rules. Um, yeah. So there have it's to be rules that are worth the, breaking. <laughs> it's also unfortunately the, the aspect that gets us turning on each other so quickly, which uh, this is true. <laughs> but like, you know, the hedgehog yeah. effect thing. But like, yes, shared trauma can definitely make us bounce off of each other in negative ways. <laughs> yeah. So like, like that was like a really important idea to this was like, I didn't, I didn't want to write a story where like the healing, I didn't want to write a story where the healing was already done, both for the characters and for everybody else, because I find the most interesting and compelling stories about healing. And if you're not down with that, I guess the game's not for you and or play a farmer with no problems, <laughs> you know? Well, you had also said earlier on that this game has a little bit of seeds of understanding where fascism comes from. I mean, it had to. It's about yeah. early 20th century Germany. Yeah. Um, and like, it's, it's fucking complicated. Like, it's a big topic. I wrote a Patreon post about like how one of the things you have to do when you put fascists in fiction is to make sure they're actually fascists and not just wearing their uniforms. Uh, because one of the things that fiction can often do is defang fascists and make their, boil their rhetoric down to law and order, mm -hmm. which is what fascists want because fascists thrive in chaotic times where they can present themselves as order, mm -hmm. uh, which is a huge part of the reason why the fascists in Flying Circus are war boys. They're marauders. They don't have snappy uniforms. They don't have grand edifice. They're basically an army of way too young people led by very cynical, powerful men and all they can do is hurt people and destroy things. They will not build anything. And I'm really proud of the fact that you can look at the art of the goths uh, in the game and go, oh, like, there's no way these people are going to put anything together. This is not the seeds of a thousand year Reich. This is raiders. Yeah, this is um, chaos in, in, a, in a disguise. Yeah, exactly. And like, that was like an important aspect of that. But like the other, the flip side of that is so the, 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 like one of the things that I actually just added onto the sheets is the languages everyone speaks. Everybody mm. speaks a language called Gothic, um, which is just German. Um, and then if you go through the people, like the chapter that talks about people, it talks about how, you know, this, this, this continent is, in the history of this continent, there was a Gotha empire that, there was a second version of and like you know it's like rome in many ways and the holy roman empire and all these like constructs that affected european history that forms a sort of supposed unified link between some of the cultures within them mm -hmm. and those people they speak gothic and they're the gothic people so it's really clear when you read that and then you go to the threat page oh and then there's the goths you know who they're fighting for and another part of the way that you know, fighting for, right? Like right. it's- Who they say they're fighting for. <laughs> who they say, but like another thing that a lot of presentations of fascists get wrong is that the, nobody likes them. When mm -hmm. the fact of the matter is that fascists are very good at endearing themselves to the people that they su are supposedly fighting for. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are very good at being a representation of the supposed values and mythology and destiny of that culture. Um, so that was like an important part. I wanted to make sure that that was emphasized. Like these guys didn't come out of nowhere. The precursor chemicals were there. And it's sort of um, that, that, that saying about, you know, like the choice will come for a society where the, the two options are socialism and barbarism. Here's barbarism. Here, mm -hmm. And we know where it came from. We know all the things like 
we know who they don't like. We know why, you know, like we know their weird excuses for not liking them. We know the, the nature of the society that they want to put together and why it is garbage. And we contrast that to our heroes who quite literally because of the move exchange system, because of the way that, um, you know, the, the different backgrounds have their, 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 their strengths, like not unique strengths. It's not essentialist, but like you come from a place, you know, stuff, you know, stuff from that place matters to you. The, the heroes, the players in this player characters in this game are rooted in a strength that comes from diverse viewpoints and diverse backgrounds yeah. and then contrasting them against people who are homogenous and who are encouraging homogeny. Um, one of the things that you might notice if you go on the goth page is that the, um, the, the character who's closest, the, the gas mask wearing soldier who is closest, if you look at his neck and his wrists and the parts of his skin that are exposed, they are blue. He's a fisherman. Mm. But there's no evidence of all the cool, unique stuff that you see everywhere else. There's no, there's no tattoos. There's no, you know, like the, 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 the dark clothing that they wear that has like this, these, these runes on them and stuff. That's all gone. It's just been subsumed. Um, and that was like important to the way that that's presented. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So now I'm gonna like 180 us. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and I'm gonna talk about, there's this moment, there's a move that is one of the most beautiful things that I've ever seen uh, in a role-playing game um, and it's Discover Beauty. Um, yeah, and I even wrote down a quote uh, from it is, um, both the natural world and the lives we live are beautiful and worth experiencing for their own sake. Um, I get chills when I say that out loud. Um, where did that come from and what does that mean to you? So firstly, that move came out of a mechanical need, which was that the stress game was slightly outrunning the, mm. the rest of it. And I needed a way to ditch one more stress somewhere that everybody had access to. Um, and this happened to be it. And the other place it came from was a desire to involve the characters more in defining the world and to create longer moments of lingering. So there's a theory that I have about game design, which is that game design shares a lot of its conceptual narrative language with cinematography. Uh, and but why what I mean with that by that is that the art of cinema is the art of compression and decompression. Uh, and another good example is comics. Comics has a lot of compression and decompression. And uh, the way that you interact with the mechanics tells you the places where time speeds up, where montages, cuts, mm -hmm. time skips mm -hmm. happen, and where things slow down, sometimes literally slow down into slow motion. Um, and it also got me thinking about the difference between American cinema and Japanese movies, and also American comics and Japanese comics, and the way that Japanese comics use decompression to set scenes that are usually in American movies done as establishing shots, um, whereas establishing sequences are more the norm in a lot of Japanese movies. And especially thinking about like, there's some really exaggerated examples of that with the work of um, the guy who directed Pat Labor and Ghost in the Shell, whose name is completely escaping me, who just makes these movies that are on morphium drips, just like these slow plotting movies that ha like dedicate minutes of runtime to looking at parts of the world moving slowly mm -hmm. over very sedate music and just basking in the existence of a place. Mm -hmm. And like Ghibli movies don't actually do that this much. They do, they do have beautiful establishing shots, but there's a lot of economy of storytelling in those movies. But I really wanted lingering shots. I wanted those. Like I had other places in this game where the decompression and expansion is really noticeable. The combat loop is all that. The combat loop is loose, 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 compressed, compressed, compressed. And then as you move in to shoot something, the game start, suddenly gets really, 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 really detailed until you're getting those individual shots of like looking down the crosshairs, the you know tracers leaping across the sky, the cut to the bullets rig, you know, ripping through canvas. Like that's a really important moment. And so there are multiple pieces of, like there's multiple moves built around those. You really and, wrote the rules to set the pace. Exactly, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, and the way that a lot of the rules are written and the way that what the rules ask you to describe to activate them are designed to do that. How like ground combat is fast and frenetic because there's one moment where everything gets established, everybody rolls and we find out who chokes, who moves, you know, what happens. And then all of ground combat from that point on, there's no rules except actually attacking one another. So at that point, it's just, you narratively describe the movements that are happening, and then you hit those points where it's just like, like those, those, uh, the fact that you roll for them is like, I do the hit and then you roll, imitates the beats of like Hong Kong action cinema, where you see a punch twice in order to make sure you got it. Yes. Um, and so, um, like, you know, that kind of thing was really important. And the Discover Beauty move, make sure that it has in it, you don't just get to do this, tell us why it matters. Tell us yeah. why this matters to your character. And it means that this move fixes a little mechanical problem that I had. It's just this little, you know, fixes, balances the math a little bit so that people aren't burning out every three sessions and are usually averaging four to five. Mm -hmm. um, but does so in a way that, you know, says, okay, slow down here. Like, we just saw something important to a character. Tell us why. And because the move can come in at any time, it's really, really useful for linking characters to the world. And it fulfills that principle in the GM section of um, making characters love the world by giving them an opportunity to stop at something and say, this is something important to me. And then the GM can later use that connection to build story part portions because a huge part of like a Ghibli movie or like a Lord of the Rings is showing you something beautiful and then either putting it in danger or showing the aftermath of another incident of fighting, of industry, of something awful, like affecting that place, affecting that person. Like it's basically a recipe that gives GMs hooks of things that they can hurt through asking people to talk about beauty uh, and also define what their characters see as beautiful. Like I have had soldier characters fly over a, like a recent battlefield and talk about how beautiful all the patterns in the smoke are. And like, oh, wow. that tells you a lot yeah. about that character. Yeah. And that lets you do things, like that lets you set up a shot later where you fly over the battlefield the next day and the smoke is gone and all that is left is the pieces. Um, one of uh, one of our um, other leadership team members talks about um, that that kind of thing where you're you're giving your your uh, master of ceremonies you're giving him a knife yeah. <laughs> he could stab you with later <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and like you know like that's what this basically does is like it sets that stuff up but the other thing that it does that's really nice is it if you really go hard on it it gives the characters a home and yeah. that's uh, that's really important in a game about always moving is that the players are not going to have a ton of connection to anywhere for very long. So giving them connection in moments and in recollection, a huge part of this game is recollection. There's a reason that stress doesn't happen when stress triggers happen in combat. Stress happens after combat and it makes you talk about it so that you can remember what triggers to hit. And that means that everybody has to recall the battle that just happened. The reputation system works the same way. Everybody has to recall what just happened so, and talk about it. And then there's that introspective moment where in order to, like the introspection part where you buy skills, a large part of it asks you to maybe talk about what just happened yeah. and how you feel about it. And that constant reliving of your own story makes it so that it is easier to tell people stories about this game later, which is an advertising tool so I can sell more copies. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I just... I just it was so I got chills again when you talked about how that's how you get to where you have a home um and and you had talked earlier about how a lot of us for various reasons don't don't get to have like we, we aren't the ones who get to be the villagers who get yeah. to kind of have that standard story um and you use the term um for those like slow moments in films basking in the existence of a place yeah um, and that seems to me like one of the kind of soul anchors, I guess, of, of what's going on in that game is being someone who doesn't have a place, but who heads toward having something that yeah. roots them. And it's also just like, you know, a huge part of this game is inevitably travel. 
and air travel and stuff. And like, I've had the good fortune. I would go to PAX East um, every year on this tiny little airline called Cape Air. And I happen to weigh the exact amount that it's a really good idea to put me in the co-pilot seat if there's not a co-pilot flying. So I have got to sit in the co-pilot seat of this little plane buzzing back and forth between um, uh, well, Augensburg, New York, in upstate New York, just over the border, to Boston. And I get to see the landscape go by underneath. And I get to see all the instruments going. And unfortunately, most of the time when I did that trip, I'm one of those people who keep prepping to the very last minute. So like, I mean, like Flying Circus, I was making stuff for Flying Circus four hours before it came out. Um, I have this image of you in the cockpit now. With like... <laughs> yeah, so like, I would actually, I, I, like I was sentient for one trip once, which was very nice. And I spent the whole trip bugging the pilot about what all the instruments meant. I was like 24. Um, and like flight is super important to me. The reason that flight and early airplanes especially is really important to me is because uh, I had a great uncle who owned an airplane. He was a pilot in the second world war and he bought a Tiger Moth trainer after the war. And some of my youngest memories are going to air shows with him and watching all the adults stand around this beautiful yellow and black plane and you know, talk about what they were gonna do, where they were gonna go, watching my dad climb into the back of it to fly, well, the front of it, it's a trainer. So the pilot sits in the back. Um, and then, you know, watching somebody yell contact, throw the prop, the engine starts up and this thing just rolls right into the sky. Like these, these planes don't have to go across the ground for very long. They just jump and it's beautiful. And this little plane was like a similar experience. There's like eight people on the plane of whom I'm one and I'm sitting in the front seat and I'm watching the landscape crawl under me. And it's the upstate New York landscape and like um, usually early spring. So like things are just starting to grow back mm -hmm. or the snow is in its like last stages. And it's just this beautiful landscape rolling by and it's a really early flight. Sometimes there's fog and just sitting and watching it all crawl by and seeing towns and highways and like little spaces. Like you learn that there's infrastructure you never know was there. Like trucks, go off the road and there are little areas, like little houses for trucks that nobody can see nestled in between the hills and the forests. And you just get to see all of it. You get to see these lakes and you get to see people's vacation houses and you're not flying very high. You're like 1500 meters off the ground. You just, you can't see people, but you can see everything that they build and you can see all the landscape around it. And it just moves by in slow motion on this propeller plane. And it's beautiful. And I really, really wanted to capture that. And I am just about to cry, but like- I, I'm feeling it too, this is beautiful. I never got yeah. to fly in my great uncle's plane. <sighs> he, I never got a chance. He built me a little plane, a little version of his plane that when I was like three, I obviously don't fit in it anymore, but it was a little pedal powered version of his plane. And I would sit in it for hours and just imagine flying and imagine what it would feel like. <sighs> Um, and the, I mean, the dedication to the book at the very start is about that. It's, you know, about, um, oh, I made this game to give people the experience of flight because I didn't fit in my little airplane anymore. Okay. I think- 100% tearing up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my heart just got like really big in my chest. That was beautiful. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for joining me and having this conversation and, and putting your heart on your sleeve like that. Um, is there anything else you want to make sure that you get to say about your game or about your experiences? I guess uh, Flying Circus 1.1 is coming out really soon. So uh, you get, there's four more pages, there's four more planes. Uh, the planes are broken out into their own little book. There's like a change log 90 items long. It's pretty intense. And then I get to start working on expansions properly. Uh, I'm doing, I'm going to use this as a chance to announce some stuff. I guess. Yes, de definitely do that, please. So uh, I'm working on two new expansions for Flying Circus, uh, one of which is just in its very earliest planning stages, uh, and one of which is about halfway done. The one that's about halfway done has a name. It's called Horror of the Heights. And it's about going to very high altitudes and finding weird things in the clouds. So it will expand on some of the ideas about like 
weird high altitude life. Uh, it's inspired by a, one second. It is inspired by a book or a short story by Arthur Conan Doyle called The Horror of the Heights. Oh yeah. Um, so it's about that. Um, I'm also, I have put a great deal of work into and I'm about ready to start properly testing the historical version of Flying Circus. Um, which is just called Flying Circus Historical. And it's um, very grim and your character can die in character creation. So that's cool. Um, and finally, I have two new playbooks coming up for the game soon. Special advanced playbooks that apply to other playbooks. Um, there's one called The Cursed, where your character has a curse, uh, which changes the way that they interact with the world. And it's kind of the way the Doomed works in Mask, where you're moving towards an unfortunate destiny and gaining power as you go. Uh, as well as drawbacks. Uh, and the other one is called the Valkyrie, where your character is discovers a, see, it's just She-Ra, it's just She-Ra. You get to be She-Ra with wings. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and play it on top of another character class. And that's being tested right now. Um, that's so exciting. Yeah, and uh, I'm still writing fiction in the world. Um, I'm writing where, a second, where can we access that, the fiction in the world? It's on a site called Sufficient Velocity, which is a really cool forum. Uh, you will rediscover why forums were great and it's terrible we lost them. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I write a whole bunch. This is how I test like everything is writing fiction there. So I'm doing a sequel to Whispers from the Deep, uh, which you can get on my itch page, uh, though I'm doing like a re-edit of it soon. That'll be cool. Um, I also have to announce something ridiculous that happened. I made friends with an erotica author and he wrote a flying circus book. It is deeply <laughs> pornographic and you will be able to buy it soon. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I just have to tell people that because it's ridiculous. I would never be able to stop telling people that. <laughs> right? It's amazing. I ended up drawing the cover for it. I was like, I can't let somebody else do this. Oh my gosh, it must be such a trip to see this world that you invented taken in so many different directions. It's really, it's, he's a great author, and I had to read the whole book through my fingers, like, eh. <laughs> um, and it will be out soon. Oh, that's amazing. That's, that's my favorite announcement ever. Okay, <laughs> I love it. It's called Dream of the Sky. It's actually, it's actually really good. Just... A lot. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I love it. Well, thank you so much. And thank you. I'm I, I'm so excited because I didn't know that there was fiction in the world. So now I know and I get yeah. to go and dig into that. That makes me really excited. Um, let me just do my closeout. Um, any closeout that you, you got to do, any closeout that you want to do about where people can I find out more? Yeah. Oh, yes. I probably should show people. Yes. That. So yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at open underscore sketchbook. Go to sufficientvelocity.com and open sketch there. I have like a billion quests. If you want to see me develop like the World War II expansion Storm Divers, that's on there. Um, or like, you know, read the weird fiction that I've been writing or like my Spider-Man fan fiction. Um, <laughs> uh, and, uh, t you know, Twitter's the place to find me. I'm on DriveThruRPG and Itch. You can find the links there. I have a Patreon. Give me money. I need it to buy more steins this got sent to me i didn't buy it um and i think that's everything just just a shout out about that twitter too because i've seen just so many interesting and deep conversations about your game specifically and about role-playing games in general like it's one of those twitter accounts where i really feel like i'm learning something by following yeah it. and i'm so sorry that i tweet so much random bullshit in between <laughs> You got you got to leaven the, the the dough a little bit. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like you get five posts thread about like gameplay theory stuff. Now you got to put up with me posting pictures of shark girls. That's I just the way it's got to be. That works. I think that's a feature, not a bug. Um. So for me, you can find me on Twitter too. I'm Quixote Jen. Q U I X O T E J E N one N no two. Um. And uh, you can see me here next week. Uh, the Gods We Know will return at six o'clock on Tuesdays. We also have Mind in the Murder at six o'clock on Mondays. So we're Monday, Tuesday, folks, six Pacific. Sorry, I always speak in the time zone that I think matters. 
Um, <laughs> that I don't tell anybody what time zone it is. Um, so it's just six specific. And um, After the Rolls is a show we just do the first week every month. Um, this is our second show and this has just been such a pleasure. And I just feel so lucky to have been able to have this conversation with you. So thank you so, so much. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Adam, you can take us off or do a raid or whatever you would like to do. Adam is our producer who is like the hidden person here right now. Um, and yeah, thank you so much everyone who joined, everyone who commented, um, everyone who listened and learned. And uh, I'm gonna wave bye to you even though I don't know when Adam's cutting us off, so. Okay, okay. All right, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go to the we'll be right back screen while we set up a raid. So hang around so that you can be part of the raid. Um, but beyond that, bye bye. Thank you for being here, and I'm so glad you could join us. Bye. Bye.